going to introduce panel three, but I also, uh, I've been kind of popping in and out with, you know, little directions about timing and coffee and seats and stuff, but I, I really want to thank the speakers who have gone so far. Um, it's just been a fabulous day, and I'm hearing that too. People are coming to me in the hallways and in this room just to thank me for having, you know, it put it found all of you and, and invited you here, so I want to thank the speakers um, all from all panels um, and the keynote speaker for coming to Providence. A lot of them had to travel far to get here to share their work, but also for doing their work. Um, you know, many of these projects, they stretch several years, they stretch decades. Um, so it's not just sharing the work today, but it's really for being there and doing that work and having that commitment. Um, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. So the third panel of the day is called Counter Mapping Providence and Tulsa. Um, I think in the morning we've heard a lot and we're all thinking about what maps show and what maps suppress. Um, the speakers on this panel are mining these questions as they relate to particular places. Most of the speakers will be presenting alternative ways of mapping Providence. Um, and our final speaker will be presenting um, a project that is mapping Tulsa. Um, so these, all of these speakers are really invested in, a, a, you know, small, very diverse cities with rich histories that are doing a lot to um, show hidden histories of these places um, and to tell us things that we haven't known before. Um, some of the speakers um, are also will be telling us sort of about one thing that I'm interested in, which is neighborhood formation. How do we, um, how, do, how, do, how do official maps of a place tell us about what our neighborhood divisions and boundaries are and how, do, how is that actually experienced on the ground? So the, the, what I'm showing you here um, is Year of the City uh, Providence. That's a project that's been running for 2019 that's almost done. And uh, many of the projects that are about Providence are uh, also really um, sort of are part of Year of the City. This is a project that's been a collaborative project that we at the Public Humanities Center um, have organized along with colleagues at Providence Public Library. Angela, raise your hand. And um, Providence City Arts, Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. There have been a lot of us who have been invested in understanding what are the hidden histories of the city that we know, because we know that there's so much that we don't know about Providence. Um, this, and I thought I would just kind of kick us off with panel three. Um, official maps of the city of Providence from 1969 and 1978. Um, just again to sort of get us thinking about official maps and how they create neighborhood boundaries, why those neighborhood boundaries change over time. The map that the city uses now is very similar to 1978. So there's actually, as you can see, a lot of change that happens between 1969 and 78 in terms of our own sense of what the neighborhoods of this city are. With that, I'm going to introduce um, all of the speakers on this panel. Dwayne Keyes is our first speaker. He is chairperson of the South Providence Neighborhood Association, leading efforts to provide public forums where all South Providence residents may have direct input in the urban planning decisions that shape the future of the neighborhood. In addition to his advocacy and volunteer work, Dwayne is full-time financial coach with Compass Working Capital, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing financial coaching and education to families and low income residents to help them build assets and financial capabilities. Our second speaker will be Marta Martinez. She is the executive director of Rhode Island Latino Arts. In August 2014, Marta published a book titled Latino History of Rhode Island, Nuestras Raices, based on her work with the Latino Oral History Project of Rhode Island. In 2004 to 2005, she was the coordinator and developer of C Coming to Rhode Island Dominican Gallery, an exhibition featuring FEFA's market based on the history of Dominicans in Rhode Island at the Providence Children's Museum in Providence. She continues to promote the importance of collecting history as a way to enhance self-pride and a sense of place by offering workshops to young people on the art of collecting oral histories, pairing them with elders and individuals who have a story to tell. Currently in collaboration with the Providence Preservation Society, Marta is working on a project funded by the National Trust 
exploring places of significance to Rhode Island's Latino communities. Aaron Forrest will be our third presenter. He is Associate Professor of Architecture at Rhode Island School of Design and Principal of Ultra Modern, an architecture design and research practice based in Providence, which he leads with his partner, Yasmin Vobis. Fourth will be Pega Rahmanian, who is the director of the Unity Center at Rhode Island College and was formerly the executive director of Youth in Action. Pega holds a BA from Oberlin College in Anthropology, Comparative American Studies, and Gender and Women's Studies, and an MA from Wright State University in Sociology. Finally, we will hear about Aunt Tulsa, why, why we have Tulsa in parentheses. Um, it, and our final speaker will be Alicia Odewale, who is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Tulsa. She specializes in African diaspora archeology span in the Caribbean and Southeastern United States. As a Tulsa native, her new project seeks to reanalyze historical evidence from the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, using mapping technology to visualize the impact of the massacre and the changing landscape of the historic Greenwood District, and launch new archaeological investigations utilizing a slow, community-based approach. In addition to her role as faculty, she also serves as the director of the Historical Archaeology and Heritage Studies Laboratory at TU and serves as the co-creator of the Estate Little Princess Archaeological Field School in St. Croix that trains local students in archaeological methods and other STEM-related skills for free. Thank you to all these next speakers. Thank you so very much, Marissa, and to you all for being here today, as well as giving me the opportunity to present um, what I want to say is a narrative about uh, my experience with these neighborhood distinctions that we have in Providence. Um, it's a conversation that we've been having long um, over the course of our existence as a neighborhood association, which I'll get more into the history as we see some of the maps that I have uh, collected and have grown to showcase as part of this narrative and what the impact has been. And also to pose the question, which I do not have an answer for, uh, when we talk about divide and conquer, are these distinctions creating scenarios, situations that are, instead of bringing us together, separating us, dividing us, and placing us in a position to compete with one another in terms of our own existence? And so that is the question right there. Are they creating silos and competition with amongst our own neighbors? So Marissa just showed you a comparison of the old map versus the current map. And I have a copy of it right near um, the neighborhoods of the city of Providence. And in particular, we have the upper South Providence and lower South Providence of which our neighborhood covers as the official recognized neighborhood association for the city of Providence. Um, we've been in existence since December of 2015. We had a neighborhood association back in the 1990s that went defunct. And as evolution of the name changed uh, with these distinctions, those two neighborhoods out of the whole entire South Side, and I'll get more into that um, in terms of that distinction, were the only two that did not have a neighborhood association covering that area. Um, when we formed, we originally just covered the Upper South Providence and actually called ourselves Upper South Providence Neighborhood Association. Again, we looked at the map. We assumed we should just focus and go with what the city had told us as the map for our covering our area. We were somewhat informally calling ourselves South Side, but when you hear people say South Side, that includes South Elmwood, Washington Park, Elmwood, Reservoir, Lower and Upper South Providence. And we said, well, there are other neighborhood groups that are recovering that, and that's just too much of an area for us to cover on our own. So let's just make sure we can start off somewhere, again, the upper. Fast forward to a year later in November, December 2016, we were actually getting uh, requests from other community partners to help organize residents in the lower South Providence section. And throughout that discussion with some of those neighbors, 
the question came up, why are we creating a separate group just for the lower part? Why aren't we just simply extending our outreach to both areas? Where when you look in this map, it looks like it's very large, but essentially you drive down one street, you're in the same area. It's not that far of a distance that we need to have two separate groups. Let's just have one. And so that led to us dropping the upper, it just being South Providence Labor Association. And out of that, many residents asked the question, where did that come from? This upper, this lower, who said that? I've always known it as South Side. Why are they trying to divide us? And so out of that conversation led me to start thinking, well, why is this the way that it is? And why do we have these distinctions that are on the one hand, seeming to celebrate our differences, but yet are creating these separations. Um, this is also kind of manifesting itself as into the wards of the city of Providence. So these are the official city wards of the city council. Again, um, Upper South Providence is uh, in Ward 11, Lower South Providence is in Ward 10. Before, when we had discussions, you would always hear about someone running. They would say, oh, they live in Ward 10, Ward 11. More recently in the media, we have seen that these distinctions of the different neighborhoods are now being written about and spoken about in those races or in those representatives. So, for example, more recently, there was an article about the council person for Ward 11, in which they said, oh, council, you know, Ward 11, which is Upper South Providence and part of Elmwood which never used to be said before. It was just simply Ward 11. So those distinctions are already starting to manifest themselves in terms of, it's not just all Ward 11, it's I'm in this part of Ward 11, you're in that part of Ward 11. There's a current special election going on in Ward 10. And so even amongst the five candidates, you hear them say, one say, I'm in Washington Park. And the other one says, oh, I'm in Lower, or lower South Side or Lower South Providence. So those distinctions of who we are, they're now becoming part of the identity and the character. And yet somehow, instead of bringing us all together, they're seeming to make the distinctions of separation of you're on this side and I'm on that side. Going back to what I was talking about the South Side, you have these six different sections, which again, were always referred to as South Side. And then not until they put up new signs and new street signs that said Upper South Providence, Lower South Providence with the street sign, did people started to say, where do these terms and these names come from? We've always referred to them informally as Reservoir Elmwood, but we never heard of South Elmwood before. <laughs> <laughs> um, this also kind of goes into the evolution of the names where, okay, it was South Side, but now we have these distinctions and then also interpreting the interpretation of those names. So what we've seen more recently when someone says South Providence, some in the media and some other folks refer to all of the South Side as South Providence. That has created some confusion when then folks contact me and say, this happened in this portion of the neighborhood, which will be in Elmwood. And I'm saying, okay, well, yes, that's South Side. That's not the South Providence neighborhood <laughs> that we talk about. So that right there is even creating those distinctions and that confusion. Or um, as we talk about in terms of um, the, the distinctions of um, new term. So we've heard, you see that portion says West End. Well, there's a portion of some folks that are now calling that area West Side. That's creating a whole new distinction. So this evolution of naming of neighborhoods is constantly going on, and there is that particular friction. What I recently learned, and I was asking, why is there an Upper and Lower South Providence? And looks like that's a matter of class. So the Upper South Providence was the area in which the white collar class, the managers of businesses and companies where I live, and the lower South Providence was the blue collar class. Who knew? This is also kind of uh, manifesting itself in terms of territory between different groups. So about two years ago, South Providence Neighborhood Association, we hosted a community meeting with John Hope Salomon House, which is in West End, right where Elmwood, Upper South Providence, in that section where it meets. 
And we have had a number of residents in Southside Aurora who went to John Hope as well as West End. And when we hosted that meeting at the end, one of the members of the neighboring groups, of the neighborhood group in, based in West End, came up to me and said, wow, this is very good, but I'm not sure understanding why you guys, SBNA, South Providence Neighborhood Association, are hosting. That's something we should have been hosting that since it's in our area. <laughs> So you're thinking about these distinctions and it's like, well, we're all one city. We're all one community. And yet this is manifesting itself with the, this map is now having that type of impact in terms of these distinctions. Another conversation that has come up is the issue of why do neighborhoods in Providence look the way they are? Why is it that when you drive down Cranston Street in Providence, one side, which has Dexter Park and Armory, looks one way and look right across the street there's a different look and feel of that neighborhood and one of the things i reflected and said well is that still a legacy of the redlining map and just the shift and um i had the pleasure of reading the color of law last year if you haven't read this book please get it and read it because it shows the policies that were impacted and i'm like oh i wonder if that happened in providence well here we go <laughs> And so this is the 1935 map that shows the red lining that the government put in place for Providence. Obviously, green is the prime area. Blue is the secondary, still prime area. Yellow is declining. And the red was the hazardous. The red sections that you can see here are now where 95 and 195 appear to be. Um, and we talk about whether this map and the distinctions still have a legacy today. Even as I look at this map, I look at the upper and lower south side, which are declining, and then I look at the Elmwood section, which was blue at that time. And then we look at the historic houses in Elmwood versus the upper and lower south Providence, that distinction is still there today. It also uh, opens up the conversation about what has determined investment in certain parts and certain areas of the city, which sections of the neighborhoods or which neighborhoods get certain tensions, certain investments, certain money, certain um, and types of focus. And then also, how do they go about with uh, claiming particular territory? So as I said, you look at the red area of Fox Point, and now that area is green. Um, and about a couple years ago, there was a business that was in that area that was having a strip club and neighbors were up in arms. And oh my God, this strip club has opened up in East Side. Mm -hmm. There were some long-term residents of color who said, wait a minute, that's Fox Point. <laughs> to make the distinction that they were not part of the East Side, they were Fox Point. And now they're claiming that area as their own. Again, these maps. Are they, still ha are they having that impact of the division rather than bringing us together? More recently, we have a hotel, a group that wants to build a hotel next to Crossroads uh, near 95. And with that discussion with the neighbors, we were asking, well, what, how does this hotel benefit the neighbors? And they were saying, oh, well, we were focusing on downtown. And we said, well, you're in Southside. Why are you focusing on downtown? Well, you know, that's just where the the area and the and the and the, the things that we want to attract people to um, you know, as patronize our, our establishment to be at. And I said, Well, we have plenty of restaurants and things to do in Southside. Why aren't you uh um focusing on that? And then out of that conversation conversation came of why are you just focusing on downtown? Why aren't you doing a circle around just the hotel and anything within that circle radius you uh promote? Again, that map, is it segregating this area from that area and who gets that attention, who gets that focus? This map also has led to a recent conversation about the impact of investment, but then even in terms of the impact of investment, these words, these, um, these terms, these maps, these names of neighborhoods still have an impact. So this is a map um, from the City of Providence's Planning and Development Department talking about the concentration of abandoned, vacant, and blighted properties throughout the city. Red is where we have the most concentration of such properties. Green is not so much or not at all. 
Now, what was interesting is that I had posted this article on social media, uh, this image as well, and just saying, okay, reflecting on this map, look at this situation here. I was amazed, not at the co conversation about this impact, but about how some of the names, according to some people, were wrong. <laughs> you look there where you see where it's Elmhurst. I had one person said, that's Smith Hill. Smith Hill Pride. Where did they get this map from? That's wrong. What's Woodville? Yeah. What's Fairly? There you go. <laughs> Fairlong. I thought that was Charles. And then we had Hope. Well, that's technically Mount Hope. And the other section up there, that's really Hope. But we call that Summit. <laughs> and all of that conversation, and all that, what was lost was we have homes. <laughs> are abandoned, vacant, and blighted. But this map with these names and this distinction distracted and took away from that particular purpose. And I said, wow, that power, this distinction, it is really causing this competition. You, you got to know where you come from. So, and more recently, I'm going to kind of elaborate as well another map that we saw with the recent property tax assessment outcomes. And when I posted this, another set of group of people said, oh, that 28% bills went up in the east side. Yep, that's Mount Hope. That's us. We had to claim that we were separate from this particular collective group. We were distinguished. We were not part of that, that group of people. So, I, again, I conclude with just asking that question as we're doing these distinctions, these neighborhood groups, these maps, and looking at these celebrating who we are in terms of, you know, Elmwood and Blackstone, are we, in effect, perpetrating the divisions that have been there for years and continuing that division and that segregation and separation? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And again, I want to just join everybody else in thanking the team from Brown and help and uh, inviting me to speak here today. And I'm really honored to, to be around everyone that has spoken all morning and that will follow. Um, I, I am the director of Rhode Island Latino Arts, and we're an arts organization um, that is going into its 31st year right now. Uh, we promote the, we are a statewide organization, and as you can see, we promote the art, history, heritage, and cultures of Rhode Island. Um, we also do part of our programs are an oral history project, and uh, in addition to collecting oral histories, we've been collecting the history in general of Rhode Island. Um, we just uh, are now in the process of setting up an archive that, uh, that reflects the, the collections of oral histories and all the documents that have come with those oral histories that have been left behind. And I'm hoping within the next year or two we'll have that up and running. But it's, it's a way for researchers and educators and journalists or anybody looking for information about the Latino community can have full access to it. So um, part of my oral history project, uh, I, uh, it, it reflects the stories and, of the lives of people in Rhode Island. And to me, that was uh, part of uh, a learning experience when I moved here. Um, I simply went out. Uh, I had moved here from, uh, I grew up in Texas, and I am, have a Mexican heritage, and I just wanted to know who the Latinos were in Rhode Island. And I just went out to just talk to people and find out more about the, the local community. And so, uh, and, and I find that that's, that's an innate um, way to, for Latinos and uh, other uh, immigrant groups is it's an oral tradition. So to me, t speaking to people was the best way to learn of where we were or who we are. Um, that led me to uh, discover a very large community that existed that not too many uh, others in Rhode Island knew about, and that's how the project grew. Um, out of that, um, I started to learn about places that were very significant to the stories that I had been told. Um, I learned about the first bodega in Rhode Island, which opened in the 1950s. And then I started to hear about uh, the first church service, the first community center, um, the first restaurant, anything that, that's, that was uh, 
took that opened after 1955, which is when the first bodega opened, became part of that history. So I wanted to start documenting that history. And again, to me, um, markers are just not part of what I, I really think the community, uh, they, they're just objects. I wanted to highlight uh, from the people what was uh, part of that history. So then this uh, barrio tour was born. Uh, I started giving walking tours, and, and it was a way of promoting the work that I had uncovered, um, the, the, um, the sites. So, so what I would tell the story based on it, the, the first, the walking tour started at the first bodega, and we would work our way down Broad Street, the, the neighborhood that Dwayne just spoke about, Upper and Lower Providence, but we call it Broad Street, which is the street that connects Upper and Lower, um, and as well at Elmwood, but Broad Street was my focus because the bodega opened on Broad Street and all of the other sites that became significant were on, happened to be on Broad Street, at least in South Providence. So I started offering uh, walking tours. And after about six months of doing that, um, it, they, my first one was during James, Jane's Walk in 19, 2015. Um, and they be, people became com, uh, uh, coming up, started coming up to me and asking for tour, tour schools, um, youth groups. They just wanted to know um, what was in South Providence. And I began to, and as I was mapping it out myself, there were other people I knew that just asked me, well, how can you be walking through those streets? Aren't you afraid? Um, it, it's really not a place that you should be hanging out. Um, I felt that, I felt very comfortable and I started to, to think that uh, people just needed to know what belonged and what, what was in these neighborhoods. So as I was mapping these, um, I was offering these walking tours after about six months. Uh, some of the neighbors who had uh, often seen me walking through the streets, somebody started to come up to me and says, what, what are you doing? Why are you bringing all these white folks into our neighborhood? What's happening here? And so I really stepped back and I realized that what I had, what started off as being a way to, to, to um, showcase, to bring people to this neighborhood that to me was a, a very important part of the Latino history was people were feeling threatened. So then I took some steps back and I thought, well, maybe I can start to um, invite some of the people who live in those neighborhoods to, to tell me what, what is it that, that's on their mind. So um, I received funding. I was very lucky to receive funding from some very um, large organizations, funders, and uh, I put together this project. And so the first thing was to put the neighborhood history right in the hands of, of the, the people who live there. Um, not only did people come and question what I was doing, but they were also giving me some, because I, I would stick to Broad Street. It's really all, of my tour reflected what the research that I had done and maybe some of the sites that I had um, noticed. Um, and also people got to know me, so I would go into some of the eateries and, and businesses and I would walk in there, but soon people who, who would see me th walking down the street says, there's this place around the corner that you should show them. There's this beautiful mural that's three blocks uh, um, down there that nobody ever goes to, to see. So that's when I, I decided, well, maybe there's a better way to give a walking tour. Um, so I, I wanted to put the, the, his, the, the tours right in their own hands. And so the way I did this was to convene a series of platicas. We, we do platicas monthly. That's one of our uh, pr uh, programs that we offer, and it's, it's a way to bring people together. So they're community conversations. And we call them platicas because um, we do them in a bilingual setting. They're done in Latino neighborhoods, and we want anybody who comes to the platicas to feel comfortable speaking in either language or in both. Um, And so based on these platicas, what I was gonna do is get let people sit in, in a, a room and, and we would talk about, uh, we would put maps out and we would talk about, they would tell me which of the sites that they thought were interesting. And then we would start ex exchanging stories and perhaps sharing more oral histories. Um, we would put a, a script together and then we would be offering walking tours. And the goal was to um, develop community pride and to raise social conscious, consciousness. So some of these um, platicas were also, uh, would have been forums for ways to, for people to raise issues or questions or, or the, the kinds of th the questions that I was getting when I was giving the tours. And then to, to have ongoing conversations about what is home. 
So the first thing I did was I reached out to people that I knew. So I had been walking these streets for so long. I had felt very comfortable. People were starting to trust me. We've talked about that. You have to develop trusting relationships. So in that moment when I was being questioned, that really, it, 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 it really raised a question inside of me. Um, and so I chose people who actually live in these neighborhoods who are either well known or, or basically who have just lived there for a long time. So I chose three neighborhoods that were significant to Latinos. So want, the first one is Broad Street. People call it La Broa. That's what it's known as because of the, the large number of Latinos that live there. Um, and this is Teresa and Candelaria. Then we chose Cranston Street, which is on the other side of the West End. That's the side that nobody ever pays attention to. That is an area that is highly Latino. And, and as you literally, as you walk, part of the, the, the mapping that I did, when you walk from one side of Cranston Street to the other, you can feel the difference almost when you cross the park. Uh, the other side that we focused on was the, where the Latinos and the immigrants in general live. And Joanne lives there, and she's a Puerto Rican descent, and she, she was very excited to be part of this project. And then I moved into Central Falls. That's where um, I, I uh, was, there's a large number of Latinos there. The whole city, is, the largest population of, uh, is of the Latino heritage. And it has some really wonderful history and some wonderful oral histories. So um, the little girl on the left, Steli, is a high school student. I was a little bit uh, more organized in Central Falls. I work with an organized group of, of students. And then the other two are residents. So these were all residents who lived there, grew up. They were well recognized and well trusted. In Central Falls, part of the project uh, was to offer workshops to train people how to do give oral, give walking tours, um, how to do oral history, so that when you talk to people, you know how to um, get their story. Uh, and then walking tours 101, which was offered by uh, people who give walking tours here in Providence. This is a, a, a group of students in Central Falls. They were going to record it on camera, and they were learning how to use their cameras. This was our first platica, and I won't, I won't uh, pretend that this was a success. There was only one person that showed up. The other two were friends of mine, and the other, other one was a, 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 group student, a group of students from the Manton Avenue Project who uh, were supposed to go to a, an event the next day. They didn't realize they got there on the wrong date. <laughs> And when they showed up, I, I made them sit down. <laughs> um, so Sylvia, Sylvia Soares, who is a storyteller, was the only person who showed up. Uh, and the other two are friends. And on the left is Brigitte, who is a, a graduate from, uh, from Brown. She was my intern at the time. And so we did, that night we did, uh, part of the presentation was to learn about the neighborhood. We did a little bit of history. This, where the Southside Cultural Center, that's where that former picture was taken. Um, if, you, if you were to walk outside in the 19th, for in the turn of the century, this is what it would have looked like if you know Broad Street and you stand right at the tip um, where it breaks out into Elmwood and Broad, that's what it looked like. It doesn't look like that anymore. And then as you walk a little for, bit further down from the Southside Cultural Center, there, uh, there's this wonderful temple that's now deserted. Um, and this is a picture taken uh, in the 1930s, I believe, and when it was up and running. And, and this is just part of the history. We, um, we talked about the, the, the life of the immigrants uh, that lived on that neighborhood. So then we decided to ditch the platicas because they just were not working. It was difficult to get people to come to a room and to sit down and, and talk. And, and, it, and they were just not in the mood to be formal, so we just ditched the whole idea. And we went outside. And at this point of the, of the grant, it was already winter, but they, they stuck to it. You can tell how cold it was, but we, we uh, made our way. We brought shovels at, at some points, and we plowed our way through. So this is Candelaria and uh, Teresa walking down Broad Street. And so what did we find? Here on Broad Street, we found, um, while we were walking, we saw a sign that said Club de Ejedrez. It's a, it's a chess club. Um, and it's, somebody went up and was interested. One of the people we were walking uh, with, 
and he went up to fix a sign. And then the person, in, it's part of a house, it's in the, somebody's yard. The person who lives in the, in the house came up just to see what we wanted. And it, as it turns out, it was an old friend of mine. I didn't know he lived there. And then he took us inside and we started discovering some wonderful things. So when we went out to actually explore the neighborhoods, people were invited us in. And we found that he has this chess club that's been around since the 1970s. And they meet once a week. It's, it's really crowded and it's very busy. So we discovered this, this chess club that existed. When we were at the West End, we found um, on the side street, we found a wonderful community garden that nobody knew about. Joanne um, wandered down because she, she just said, let's see what happens if we go down the street. We found this really amazing community garden that nobody knew about. And then in Central Falls, we started to look up and we discovered some changes. Not necessarily uh, the group that we were with didn't feel that there were positive changes. The signage was starting to change. It was something was happening that, that raised questions and it was uh, part of our discussion as we met later in our platicas. Dexter Street signs are usually black and this is what's happening now. We also found that there were markers that nobody knew about. There were people who had grown up in Central Falls, didn't realize that there was such a thing as a South Central Falls. It's such a tiny place, it's one square mile. How can there be a South Central Falls? But there was a historic district and there were these markers. And then once you open your eyes and you look around, there were markers that said South Central Falls all over one section of South Central Falls. And then we uh, started to look at the neighborhood, uh, that we started to look at things that you, you, drive through, you drive through and see or walk and just kind of take for granted. And we uh, looked at some of the, the murals that, that were there, kids that, that were walking with us just start, walked by and studied them. They had never really taken the time to do that. This group discovered that this was done by, uh, painted by another class in the same high school that they went to back in the 1990s. It was the very same school. And then in the West End, we discovered this really wonderful temple that, that I knew was there, I had forgotten. Um, but we wandered down there and discovered this, wonder, uh, this really great on Hannibal Street um, that has a, a large Cambodian community that was this really amazing temple. And then as we're walking down the street, I started to dis to um, places that I knew I would invite the, the groups that I was with to go inside. So as we're walking down Youth in Action, we went inside and we found that they were doing mapping as well. There was a map in there and we discovered that there were other, there are other ways, that there were other maps and mapping happening on Broad Street. This is a youth group that was mapping uh, ways and it's, it's, it looks similar to a, a presentation that we saw this morning. In the chess club, there was a, that's supposed to be a map, I asked, and doesn't quite, can't quite figure out what it was, what it is, but somewhere in there supposed to be the Dominican Republic. He was still painting it, and I believe it might be that area that that's, has a black dots on it. So he was also mapping. We came in to, across a grocery store, and I often stop and look at this, this beautiful mural because I remember what it looked like before it became a, a mosaic uh, mural and there was a map. The, the kids stopped to look at the map and we also met the artists so we, we started to talk people who were creating maps. He was working with a youth project and they had um, brought together the city arts kids who were across the street and they had contributed this so he was creating a map on the side of the wall. And as you walk around the corner, there's just another gorgeous mural. So we were looking at mural art and I took him down the street and we looked and there's another map. This was a, the artist's ren rendering of Broad Street during the time that he was creating this mural. He spent almost two years there and he became very close to the, neighbor, the neighborhood kids and he started adding them to the map, but that's Broad Street. That was his version of a map of Broad Street. And then there's one of our stops that we do on, on uh, our walking tour. It's a new pizza place, it's called La Broa. And again, it uses the name of uh, what the neighbors, the residents call Broad Street. Um, I took them inside and an entire wall of La Broa pizza is a map. 
And as you can see, there's a little pizza there, so that's where they're located. But it was a really um, very uh, intricate, detailed map on the entire side of the wall of, of Labroa Pizza. And then we started to do our own mapping. So that's a map of Central Falls. And that's a uh, uh, this place matters marker. And este lugar me importa. The kids in Central Fa Falls started by mapping where they lived, mapping places that they were familiar. The difference between the group in Central Falls and in, on Broad Street, uh, Broad Street it was very organic. We just brought people in and, and they joined us and they gave us their places of significance. Um, the, the, the Central Falls was a group of kids uh, that, that we refer to as newcomers that who have just moved to this country. They, they, they're freshly in, in the, the schools. They've either arrived last September or last week. They're kids that are still getting to know their neighborhood. So I thought that what a better way to create a map was, uh, and to show them where they live. So we started mapping um, first where they live and then places that they were familiar. And then I took them around the city of Central Falls and that project is still, still happening for the next six months. We'll be working on this. So they're, they're at, we're adding pins to the places that they have discovered. I give them a historical tour and then they add those, those pins on there. They're actually stickers. And then they, they go home, the next week I come back and they start adding uh, stickers on it of places that they've been to and then they talk about them. And th they're creating their own version of a map so that the, when the next group of newcomers move to their school, they've got a tour for them already and then they Im invite them to add their own stickers. Then we uh, use these opportunities, as I said earlier, to raise social consciousness. So we talk about what it, me what it meant when uh, you saw that early map that Duane put in, those several maps, before the highway came and divided. And part of the division that happened in South Providence and other areas was when the highway was built, it cut neighborhoods in, into pieces. And so it, it pretty much said anything on that side of the highway, that's almost like saying that side of the railroad tracks, is, is blighted, territory, blighted territory. And as you cross from what is known as Washington Park, uh, into Broad Street, it's all Broad Street. Um, that people, when you cross that highway and then there's another section at the other end, when you cross into downtown, it's a way um, people just get the message that your area is blighted. And in fact, when I did some research, it, was, it wasn't until that highway, it was once that highway was built on both ends that um, people felt that, that, that um, the government was for, had forgotten about South Providence housing. Uh, many of the houses started getting um, boarded up. Less, they felt that uh, less services were being offered. So it was those, that division of the highway at, at either end that, uh, that changed the attitude about the people that live there. But these walking tours and, and creating uh, a community mapping, uh, it was a way of making people feel like, well, this is my home, this is where I eat, this is where I shop, and I don't care if those two highways are where, this is, this is where we are. Uh, so we had a lot of discussions about what, uh, during the Platicas, what this meant. And then we did some, uh, I did, this is some, some, some of the uh, places that I take that were very important to the Latino history. So this is a story of the first bodega. It's a bus shelter that's right near the bodega. Oh. And then we did our walking tours. We bought some merchandise, um, T-shirts, maps. And then we offered the walking tours on three dates, April, um, April the fir first Wednesday in April, in case you didn't know, is National Walking Day. So we picked that day and we went out on a walk on the three neighborhoods. And then we did a Jane's Walk weekend walking tour. And that's our uh, West End walk, that's Joanne and our group, and then we did Upper South Providence. And that's uh, our tour in front of La Broa Pizza, Dexter Street in Central Falls. And that's the tour on Dexter Street. The, the one in Central Falls, the, the, this was the, the, the one that was offered to the public, but then we did additional and we're still doing more tours with the kids, with the residents themselves. The teachers um, and the Central Falls High School and the middle school have invited us to give tours because they feel that many of the teachers who work there 
also don't know the, the neighborhood or the city, so they they want us. They want their. If it's important. They, the superintendent feels that it's important. If you're going to be teaching in Central Falls, you should know where you, where your students should live. And then we created the map. So there's one map. Let me just go back. So this map, we also use it as, as a way to educate people. So we had a Chimi truck tour map on Broad Street. There's a section, there's a, a large section there that where, where the Chimi trucks come out when the sun goes down. That's a Dominican, very Dominican. I personally learned a lot about that. And as we were doing that, we gave people menus and we, we gave them things to order. So we would stop at the Chimi trucks and they had a chance to, to purchase. Uh, we gave them a little history of the Chimi trucks. What are they? Nobody knew what they were. They heard about them. So it was a way to educate people about a particular culture. The Dominicans um, are the largest uh, Latino community in, on Broad Street. And then there's our other one. That's Cranston Street. And these are the, the takeaways. We felt that uh, the takeaways were the, the, the people who live there now feel more connected. They feel very proud of their neighborhood. They feel that it has been put into this virtual map now especially the other side of Cranston Street that's often forgotten, um, and Central Falls as well. But the, the, the actual takeaway that people uh, took home with them was this map so that they can come back. Once they, they feel comfortable having gone through this tour, they can come back to some of the places that we highlighted, restaurants, places to shop, um, beauty shops, nail salons. And that's our information if everybody, anybody needs to know where we are. Thank you. Hi everyone, how are you feeling? Okay, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, a little shake, <laughs> okay. Um, well, so hello, uh, my name is Pega. It's like Pegasus minus the sus. Uh, and yeah, you can laugh. It's the funniest thing I'll say, so. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, you know, who am I? <laughs> I'll tell you who I'm not. I'm not a cartographer, uh, that's for sure. But I am a girl who likes maps, uh, and I work with young people. So I thought, uh, there's a couple things I love, and when you do nonprofit work, you have to find ways to integrate those things you love, um, even if they don't make sense. So maps was one of them, and the other was camping. Uh, and both of those things, my kids were like, what are you doing to us? Um, <laughs> these things are really foreign. So. Uh, Marissa asked me to come and talk a little bit about a project that we did, um, which we called Corridor Communities, which was in part funded by the Rhode Island Council for Humanities, um, wonderful funder here in the state. So um, anyway, I, my background is in youth development and uh, youth organizing work. And uh, now I'm in higher ed and I do identity work there. And I, I guess the thread that pulls those things together is I, I love this idea of taking identity and specifically social identities and locating them um, and being able to use that as a way to define the parameters and the borders that we cross and that we break down or that we create. So um, th this presentation is about my work with Youth in Action. Um, which is still around and has been around from, uh, since 1997. Marta, thank you for the shout out. That was a good picture of Youth in Action right across from Sanchez on Broad Street. It's no coincidence, I think, that the folks that are doing presentations on, on Providence um, all are located on the south side. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really interesting uh, space in the city, um, and especially Broad Street, which is the corridor uh, that links downtown all the way to Patuxent Village. So you go from a downtown kind of urban metropolis kind of metropolitan um, feel. Well, I don't know, metropolitan, but uh, <laughs> as, as much as we're gonna get in, in, in Rhode Island. And, um, and you go through La Broa and, and you continue through to Washington Park. Um, and then you end up in this pretty affluent neighborhood, um, Patuxent Village. So it's this really interesting cross section of Providence. Um, and the South Side, my understanding is that it's always been this kind of frontier for immigrant communities. So first you had the Jewish communities, then you had the Irish communities, then you had the black communities, and now you have Latino and Afro Caribbean communities. And so it's been this really interesting place for um, 
just for folks that are curious, <laughs> right? To, to explore and expand upon. Okay, so Youth in Action um, is on, on Broad Street on the South Side, uh, like I said, since 1997, founded in part by youth um, and really, you know, over those 20 plus years, the part of the mission that's never changed is how integrated young people are in the governance and the programming and in the participation of this organization. So uh, more than what Youth in Action does, I think it's uh, who we serve and who is a part of our organization. So the young people at Youth in Action are from what we call frontline communities. Um, and frontline we define as these are communities that carry a disproportionate share of economic, social, and environmental burdens. But here's the interesting part. Not only do they carry these burdens, they're told that they do so because there's something inherently inadequate about them. And that's a piece that's really interesting to us, this, this idea, this internalization that there's something wrong with you. And so the work that we do at Youth in Action, if that's who we serve, the work we do is say, what if, what if it's not you? What if it's the structures in place um, and, and the power in place? And so everything at Youth in Action is about this social justice lens of the relationship between identity and power and how that's located. So um, the Corridor Communities Project started, so Youth in Action has a kind of a four-year cycle program curriculum. And the core of that program is called CORE. And um, not not super creative. Um, and uh, the core is broken into two parts. So the first part is really thinking about the individual. Um, and so we talk a lot about identity. Who are you? Um, we talk about social identities, this idea that some identities place you in society. Um, and then we transition into the location part and the like placing of that identity. And so this is where I was like, OK, I love maps. So let's take this opportunity <laughs> to do maps. I also realized that none of my young people could point to where they live on a map, or I could point to where Youth in Action was on a map, or even where Providence was in Rhode Island. And that felt <laughs> scary to me. Um, I'm a doomsday person. So I was like, listen, you have to know where you are. Um, and then that idea also started, I, it like resonated with me because when you do work with young people, you know, one of the things that folks are always telling young people, oh, and I guess I should say when I say young people and who youth in action serves, uh, 14 to 18, so high school age youth. Um, people are always like, what are your goals? Where will you be in five years? What are you going to do? Where, you know, they're always like in the future. And um, if you really know how to work with young people, you know that uh, it's really important to talk about where are you right now? Because <laughs> we can set up all the goals and destinations in the world, but if we don't know where we're starting, and I give you direction, so let's say California is the goal, it kind of is for, oh, no, milk, land of milk and honey. Um, so if we say California is the goal, and I have no idea where you're starting, but I give you some directions to hop on Highway 17 that then connects to Highway, I don't, right? then you have, you have no idea if that's not exactly where you're from. So it's really, really important to say, okay, where are you starting? So I can give you the correct directions and you can, they can be familiar to you and, and you can use them to find your way. And so I thought, okay, this is great, poetic, metaphorical, we can use maps. Um, and, and, and so we, we started this conversation of where are you? Locate yourself and where do you want to go? And the great thing about maps was that there's no predetermined beginning. I mean, you can start anywhere in a map. That story starts wherever your finger lands and it ends wherever your finger lands and everything in between becomes this really interesting journey. Um, and so this participatory action research piece of it made so much sense because the story was so raw and honest because it could start anywhere. Um, they still don't know how to find themselves on the map, but that's, <laughs> but that's fine. So, um, so is that what I want to say about that? Yeah, that's what I want to say about that. So that's, that's Youth in Action. So, um, we started planning for this mapping project and it was really, um, based on this idea or this project that had happened in the Bay Area. Um, cartographer there at, um, Berkeley, um, Darren Jensen. 
uh, really wonderful guy. And he does what he calls guerrilla cartography. Um, so if you haven't seen this, I check it out. It's so cool. Um, he also does this project about <laughs> one of his students did mythical creatures. Um, and where do people, ha where have stories happened of mythical creatures? Um, and then tracking them over time and how they move based on this like lore. <laughs> and soon it's going to converge and there's going to be this epic battle of mythical creatures. Uh, but anyway, so, um, so the, our project was really based on this project and a number of other kind of story gathering, storytelling projects. Um, and the way it was introduced, because maps can actually feel very abstract, even though they're very concrete um, to, to young people. So I started with um, the, have you heard the TED talk, uh, Danger of a Single Story? Yeah, it's wonderful. So um, it's the author of Americana or how to be, uh, this is a feminist, or how to be a feminist. So it's a, gr it's a great TED talk, and sh she talks a lot about the single story and how when you tell one story of a people, but you tell that story again and again and again, you in fact make that their story. And that is power, right? Um, and it flattens, it flattens an identity, and it flattens an experience, and it flattens a people. And so I started, I, I started with this. I showed them this TED Talk, and we talked about what parts of your identity have been flattened and what parts of your neighborhood's identity have been flattened. And then we went to, OK, well, maps are flat, aren't they? <laughs> and, um, and then we said, but are they? <laughs> and they're not. Maps are really multidimensional um, because of the contour lines, right? There are things on maps that suggest to us depth. And so I did this cool little trick where you draw lines on your knuckle and you say, oh, this is a map with the contour lines. And then you go like this and it, it raises and you're like, but it's not flat. It's better when you do it. But um, <clears throat> I, it's, a, it's a good moment with them. Their minds are like, whoa. Um, and so if the map is not flat, then what, can we what stories can we tell in those contour lines or whatever we want to be our contour lines? And so we did this project where we, um, uh, some of the maps that Dwayne was showing, uh, we took a bunch of those. Like, uh, there's, a, there's a ton of them, like chemical exposure, and it shows chemical exposure placed on the map, or medium, median income, or playgrounds in, in the city, or, um, I don't know, uh, schools. Like, it's just so many maps. And so we took each of those maps, and we printed them on transparency, and we started to layer them. So we said, if we just hold up one map, the chemical exposure map, what does that tell us about our neighborhood? OK, you know, and we, 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 we talk about that. Now, what if I add a layer? What if it's chemical exposure, and now it's playgrounds? Now what story does that tell about our neighborhood, and what story does that tell about you? And we, keep, we kept doing this. We kept layering it. And the last layer was this uh, map of Rhode Island. And it was a map of Rhode Island and stereotypes, and that was kind of at the back. And so that kind of set the stage for all of this story. Um, so, um, and then we started hitting the streets uh, and, and collecting information, and we wanted to put together an exhibit. And that exhibit had four parts. It had a part about locating story, and so the question was, what kind of story do we want to tell? Um, it had a part on perception. It had a part on how we orient ourselves, um, and, and it had a part on, uh, oh, right, on participatory mapping. So, um, so we start. We set out to start this this exhibit, and this question of of um, story, how we how we map story, we ran into a little bit of an issue because what we wanted to do was is is uh, tell the opposite of the stereotype, but <laughs> when we started asking our students like, what do you want to map? It was like we were mapping stereotypes. <laughs> it was like they wanted to map fast food and uh, like obesity and how that played out on the Broad Street. And like it would show that upper and lower south side, you know, folks were more obese because there was more fast food because it's poor, right? Like, and we're like, oh God, no, we don't want to perpetuate 
the message that you continue to receive. So how can we reframe it? And so this is what these, these particular maps I'm going to show you was about reframing. So this one we said, OK, we do want to talk about fast food. That's important to talk about. But how can we talk about it in an asset way versus a deficit way? And so we also, we, instead, of, instead of doing it with obesity or some social <laughs> indicator, we did it with food trucks, the chimney trucks that Marta was talking about. We did it with those. And so now when you look at this map, um, there's little trucks, and then there's like little soda and hamburgers. Um, that's the universal sign for fast food. Uh, <laughs> and you can see that the part where there's a ton of food trucks is so rich with culture and history. And so now it was telling a different story. It wasn't telling the story of obesity. It was telling a story of culture. Um, and, and that was like, that was the story we wanted to tell. And so this map, I think, really tells like, a story of these institutions' relationship to the actual corridor. So you're seeing like, OK, in this section of the corridor, there's this piece. The next map was hair salons and auto. So they really wanted to talk about gender as it played out uh, along the, the corridor. And we were like, we ran into the same problem. Like, oh, that's a little problematic. <laughs> and so instead, we said, what are symbols or what are like institutions that might represent gender along the corridor? And it was hair salons and auto shops. Um, and so we started to map that along the corridor and make our, you know, make our own assumptions about that. Uh, and then one of the final maps that I'm going to show you is the religion and crime. And this map is interesting because it takes, it, it actually has nothing to do with the corridor and more to do with the relationship between these two institutions that we were mapping, crime and religion, which I, I think is a little counterintuitive that in fact where these sites of, uh, like, religion are, or like faith, crime intensifies. Um, I always thought my assumption was, oh, there's community surrounding religious communities and faith, and so there's more like community policing that might happen. But in fact, what we saw was that there were more incidents. So we did all these maps. I don't know how to use GIS. So we did all these maps on Illustrator, um, Adobe Illustrator, and we, we just walked the corridor. We took the bus along the corridor. We, um, drove, and we try to go at the same time every day and collect information and just like have the students sit there and talk to folks or, and in our, in our exhibit, we had, um, they would have to go. So with the auto shops and the beauty salons, um, they have to go in and interview at least three or four folks and then have that story attached to the map. Um, so then the other part of the exhibit was perception. How do we perceive ourselves in these places? Uh, so we have drawings that they had to complete. They, you know, you'd have a squiggle line, and everyone would, what does that squiggle line look like to you? Um, it was fun. The kids who came to our exhibit, especially like that. Um, and then we had them look at maps of Providence and see if they could see an object they could trace in the map. What did they see in the map? And so someone saw a dog. <laughs> Um, and then the last piece, and you've seen this map, is the Providence neighborhood map, right? And we had them scratch out the names that were there and write the stereotypes that they understood of those, those neighborhoods. So what do you call this neighborhood? So um, Mount Hope was Mount, what was it? Like, uh, I can't remember what they called it. But I know like, like it riffed off this idea like the high schools here all have nicknames. So like Mount Pleasant is Mount Pregnant or Hope is hopeless, right? Um, and so it riffed off that. So like uh, hope was like, they just wrote white people. Um, <laughs> you know, or like Silver Lake was gangs. Um, and so they just, they wrote, they wrote their ideas of what it was. And we talked about, okay, if you looked at a map and you didn't see names of neighborhoods, but you saw the stereotypes of those neighborhoods, how would that change your relationship to them? And then um, another part of the exhibit was the participatory mapping piece. And so we took tape, because we're a nonprofit, and we <laughs> taped along one entire wall, the Broad Street Corridor. I got very familiar and intimate with all the crooks and crannies. And we had people who come, came to our exhibit um, write on sticky notes um, experiences that happened to them along the corridor. So some of them said, this is the first time I got kissed. And they placed it you know, along the corridor. Or um, this is where my mom, my aunt, and I went and got our hair done for my prom. 
or, you know, like different stories. And so we collected all these stories and we didn't do anything with them, but they were interesting. <laughs> um, we should have done something with them. So this whole wall was filled with these little anecdotes and it was collecting memory, um, which was a really cool thing for us. And then the last part of the exhibit was uh, what if. So at Youth in Action, we did, th we did this con question continuum, this idea that every question is powerful, but some are less powerful and some are more powerful. And so uh, less powerful would be like a yes or no question. And a really powerful question would be a what if question. Um, so it encourages imagination and curiosity. And so I posed the question to them. I, we talked about how maps are oriented north for the most part. Um, or near north, and it's typically that means up <laughs> or on top, uh, when in fact, like in terms of earth and space and gravity, there is no up. But on maps, we do, we assign an up. And by doing that, by saying north is superior in some ways, by like centralizing or focusing our narrative around the northern hemisphere, well, who lives in the northern hemisphere? A lot of white folks, right? And so, um, what are we doing by doing that? What are we saying? What are we making our worth? So if we took the Providence map and we oriented it south, that's interesting. <laughs> what story would it tell? Who, who would be superior? Um, so this what if question was really fun and we had a big piece of butcher paper up during our exhibit and we asked people, what would the world look like if it was oriented differently? Um, and so I'll just finish by saying uh, I still love maps, <laughs> and so I still find ways to play with them and use them as um, mediums and devices to tell story. Uh, and so we did another iteration of this exhibit, and we did something called Broadopoly, where, um, again, our students went out and they gathered all this information, and we riffed off of Monopoly, and they were really fascinated by gentrification. This was like what they wanted to talk about. They didn't know how to they didn't know how to define it, but they knew this is happening to my neighborhood. So um, we made a board game out of it, like a life size. You were the you were the uh, playing piece, and you like jump along, and um, and we used information, housing information from our neighborhood. So it reflected the blight, it reflected the urban renewal, it reflected it reflected all of that, and you played the game. Um, so that was one iteration that we, we played with for mapping. Um, we mapped the invisible or the hidden histories. So uh, have you heard of geocaching? Maybe, yeah, okay. Uh, there's something, it's the analog version, is letterboxing. So you carve stamps, yeah, it's totally dorky, but um, you carve stamps and you hide the stamps and, and it's like geocaching, but there's a stamp involved. Um, and there's like riddles and it, there are no coordinates. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> Again, pulling in things I like to do and making the kids do them. I was like, let me tell you about letterboxing. And so we went and found some letterboxes and realized there were like only two letterboxes on the south side. And one of them you had to pay to get into is in Roger Williams Zoo. Um, and so we mapped, a so we hid a bunch of letterboxes and created riddles to them and then created a map to them that you can find online. So now there's a ton of letterboxes on the south side of Providence. Um, that kids made. So, uh, and then the last piece is querying the campus map. So there's this also this really great digital archive mapping, like open source mapping thing called querying the map. I think it started in Canada, uh, but it's, it's international and um, it collects queer memory. Um, and so you can just go on and you, you kind of push a point and you write your anecdote of queerness and it's there forever, um, which is really cool. So at, at Rhode Island College, um, it, you know, it can feel very homophobic, like much of this country. <laughs> and so our students who identify as queer were like, our stories matter as well, and we want to be seen. And so, um, but we don't want to be so visible that we're attacked, right? So, um, so we're, myself and this professor of anthropology, uh, Dr. Elijah Edelman, we're going to be creating a map of Rhode Island College and collecting these stories so folks can go in and actually um, similarly click a pin and tell a story. So um, hopefully for not a cartographer, but a girl who likes maps, um, this seemed interesting. <laughs> Thanks for thanks for listening. And, uh, thank you uh, to uh, Marissa for the invitation to participate. It's been.
pretty incredible and educational uh, day for me, and I'm excited to be able to contribute and also to be. Yeah, sorry about that, and to be on the um, panel with such a great uh, group of Providence and uh, and Tulsa scholars. Um, so I'm a. I'm an architect and I teach uh, studios at RISD and I have a, a design office here in town. And I wanna uh, talk about a project that really started uh, with a building and then uh, expanded to look at the city and then came back to focus again on specific works of architecture uh, in Providence and uh, the way that they kind of proposed a new relationship with the city. And I should uh, say up front that this is a um, collaboration with my partner, uh, Yasmin Vobis, as well as uh, three uh, RISD students, uh, Dave Waite, Liz Parker, and uh, Kunyue Chi. Um, uh, Liz Parker is here today somewhere in the back. There she is. Um, they did an uh, incredible amount of work on this. And like all of our projects, there was uh, very little money and also very little time. Um, so this really couldn't have happened without them. Anyway, three years ago, um, my partner and I worked with a group of RISD students, uh, the City of Providence and the Southside Cultural Center of Rhode Island to design and build uh, this performance pavilion and uh, um, kind of attached garden to help the cultural center expand their operations. Um, and I should say that uh, Marta Martinez was, was actually uh, part of uh, part of this project uh, because of her relationship with the, the cultural center. Um, and uh, the site was actually uh, originally this space as this acre plus parking lot behind the cultural center and the Trinity uh, United Methodist Church that's attached to it. And that uh, the cultural center had and the church had already been using for uh, summertime events but really was not hospitable to that kind of thing, uh, partly because people were always parking their cars there. Um, and the, um, the zoning had actually uh, changed to allow reduced parking in this area. So the huge parking lot all of a sudden became a very useful and valuable space because the city would allow us to have fewer parking spots. Um, and so what we proposed was to basically cut the parking lot in half and build this green band uh, connecting the two adjacent streets um, and then uh, end up with this uh, uh, kind of strip uh, as well as a performance pavilion that would then form the new entrance um, to the to the cultural center and uh, and form this kind of stronger connection to the city at large. And so this is a photo just after it was finished. And um, the Cultural Center uses the, the space now for events and meetings and performances. Uh, but what's important, I think, in this context isn't so much uh, um, the, that specific uh, actions of this particular building, but it was designed and built outside of standard development uh, models. It was a partnership between academic institution, the city, the cultural center, and a few other local organizations. And um, it was paid for mostly by grants from Art Place America and Rhode Island Housing. It was um, part of the uh, creative placemaking industrial complex uh, that Rustin mentioned earlier, but uh, I think we kind of found a purpose and were able to escape that uh, to a certain extent along the way. Um, but what the project really did was allow a new civic space uh, for the city to emerge out of what was mostly barren asphalt. And it is on private property that belongs to these two, um, to a religious institution and to the nonprofit. But at the same time, it, it does form a, um, a uh, valuable public space uh, in this area. Um, and we, if we fast forward to last winter, uh, uh, Yasmin and I were contacted by the curators of the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism, which is a, um, an architecture exhibition that happens every two years in Seoul, South Korea, um, to participate in their cities exhibition, um, which was organized around the theme Collective City. And they asked if we would uh, do a project about Providence. And they're interested, um, they contacted us because they had seen the South Light project and they were interested because it was a piece of architecture, but also made a kind of contribution to the urban realm. And they asked if we could find other examples that followed a similar model here in Providence. And so the request kind of prodded us to, to look back at the project, which again was done very quickly with very little money. Um, 
and uh, we had to kind of zoom out a bit and think more deeply about the context in which we were working. And this resulted in a map. And uh, this is not our map. This is uh, Google Earth. Uh, but it's a, a recent aerial photograph of Providence, which bears the evidence of some of the major post-war acts of renewal um, that were focused really on making the city friendlier to cars. And one of them is pretty obvious. It's this uh, uh, arc of the freeway uh, that was cut through in the, in the post-war years. Um, and then the other, which takes a little bit uh, more squinting at the map um, are parking lots. So this is an overlay of all the surface parking lots in downtown and the um, upper south side. Um, and it doesn't really, it doesn't count residential driveways or multi-level parking structures. So it's really just kind of underutilized uh, asphalt. And they're kind of hidden from view on first glance in a lot of maps. But the dominance of surface parking in the city is, I think, spatially even more consequential than uh, the freeways themselves, just in terms of sheer amount of space used. And then especially if you compare that to the amount of green space uh, in the city, um, whether public or private, uh, you can see that there's just a lot more surface area in the city that's devoted to cars than to, to people. And parking lots tend to be um, private and you know that you have attendants who are there to make sure that you're not doing anything incorrect on them so that even though they're empty they're really not functioning as um, as public space as uh, as they are now and certainly not very friendly spaces on the south side uh, where the zoning was very lax for a long time this is what most of this space uh, takes so drive through restaurants, banks, gas stations. Uh, this is right next door to the, um, to the cultural center itself. Um, and then in the downtown as well, this kind of, um, of, of space, I, I don't even know how to describe it, um, has supplanted the built fabric of the city. And this, uh, uh, those of you who are in Providence or have, have walked around the city, uh, will know this propped up facade on Waybosset Street that's in front of a big parking lot. It's kind of a poignant indicator. Um, so the map can be easily read in a, a purely negative light, and this was definitely our first reaction, was that the car had ruined Providence. Um, but then uh, looking back at South Light, we also thought about how the abundance of uh, vacant land in Providence was also an opportunity to kind of redefine the city um, one lot at a time. We actually, be, uh, thanks to this kind of um, abundance of of open space, we have this opportunity to um, think about, uh, you know, of course, uh, commercial development as it as it's happening in downtown, but also ways that uh, um, how we can allow citizens the space and freedom to experiment with alternative models of design and alternative models of development. So really not just looking at profitable development or top-down um, kind of renewal projects, but true alternatives. And so we began to see each black polygon on the map as an opportunity to try and uh, think about building the city differently. And so we began to look for recent examples where a piece of architecture had taken on an underutilized plot of land to propose a new way of inhabiting the city. And so um, the result was a series of uh, 10 pamphlets, um, each about an individual uh, building or a design, um, uh, occasionally not executed, from the past 60 years. And the criteria for selecting these projects were really one that they had to contribute both as a work of architecture and as an urban proposition and to do so with some ambition. Um, and I won't get into uh, what what this means exactly, but we, we wanted, um, we didn't want to look at just kind of humdrum or, or bad buildings. And we didn't want to look at projects that were, were just constructed um, through business as usual. And then uh, in terms of their relationship to the city. So, and then we were also uh, looking at projects that didn't follow uh, typical development models. So neither commercial nor really driven uh, by a large institution. There's a lot of great buildings on the Brown campus, but none of them uh, made it into the into the book. Um, so interestingly, these criteria led us to a kind of surprising group of buildings. Some are by very famous architects, uh, others by um, uh, local architects uh, 
who were kind of compelled by the circumstances to try something different. And the focus ended up being primarily on uh, the west and the south sides, uh, these parts of the city where things are still unfinished and the, the story has yet to be, uh, yet to be written. Um, so this is, uh, this is a map of the projects that we looked at. Um, and uh, most of the projects are in Providence, but uh, we really looked uh, at a kind of broader field of, of greater Providence. There's a few that are up in Central Falls as well. Um, and then this is the um, list of uh, architects with images of, of many of the projects. You may recognize some of these if you're architects. If you're not an architect, you might know I am Pei. Um, but uh, uh, a number of these are fairly well-known uh, known architects from the 1960s all the way uh, to the present. Um, and so to tie everything together, we looked at uh, into kind of constructing a longer history of this question of vacancy or emptiness in the city, uh, looking back to um, its uh, settlement in the 17th century and exploring how vacancy has been leveraged at key uh, moments in the city's development. Um, so as many of you probably know, it started out as a kind of tightly settled fishing village um, that then transformed into an industrial hub for the region. Um, but even at this early moment where you have these kind of long, narrow, narrow lots, they were immediately oriented around a kind of unspoken central void in the city, um, which, uh, which, is this, um, which is the Narragansett Bay, this big flat expanse of water and the Providence uh, River that comes up um, into the city. Um, and so uh, these spaces uh, formed, first of all, the kind of organizational um, center uh, for uh, settlement in the region by uh, European colonists, um, but then also the, the um, heart of the city's economy from the start. Um, eventually, the bay was kind of uh, structured and formalized into this giant elliptical cove that connected uh, the harbor uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, Blackstone Canal, um, and was this really large? I mean, half kilometer wide ellipse, um, and then uh, that was built on a in a kind of marsh. That was then eventually and, and actually fairly quickly supplanted by uh, the railroad. And uh, what's kind of interesting looking back at these historic aerial photographs is the sheer scale of, of the railroad. Um, and you start to understand that there is this issue of scale really comes into stark relief here. This railroad extends a mile uh, and all the yards associated with it uh, extend at least a mile north and to the west of the city. Um, and it's filled not just with, with tracks, but with machinery, supplies, warehouses, depots, et cetera. And Providence was never that large in terms of its population, um, but uh, its infrastructural role in the region always far outweighed its population. So every change to the infrastructure of commerce led to a wholesale reconstruction of the city. And then, uh, of course, commerce and cars brought additional changes. This is the Crawford Street Bridge, which in the Guinness Book of World Records was the widest bridge in the world, covering up the Providence uh, River and supporting this network uh, of, um, of roads and plazas, first for, um, for uh, horse-drawn carriages and then for cars. Um, and then uh, the the... Um, the freeways. And this is a photo of I-95 and 195 under construction. You can see the amount of the city that was kind of torn apart in order to make space for the automobile. And with the kind of efficiency of the automobile also came this need for parking. Um, so uh, Providence recently won another award for um, uh, uh, best uh, reformed parking crater. This is, this is actually the site of, of the cove that I was talking about earlier, that uh, half mile wide ellipse that then became rail yards and then eventually just became giant parking lots and now has been supplanted by, um, by some other things. So there has been some progress on this front. 
Um, but parking really has taken up a huge amount of space in the city. Um, and then uh, uh, there's also been uh, the problem of white flight and disinvestment that's then led to a lot of um, abandoned and vacant property, particularly on the um, on the south side and the west side of Providence, um, uh, that has been slowly filled filled back in. Um, sometimes with buildings, sometimes with more parking. Um, but each of these era, eras of vacancy, which which again um, arise not only out of kind of um, negative um, uh, or pejorative conditions, um, but also out of the, the city's role within the region as an economic hub, each time had a kind of architectural expression. And um, this is the Providence Arcade, which um, which uh, served as a kind of parallel to um, a commercial parallel to what was happening in the harbor and uh, and the rail yards, and formed this kind of little commercial indoor commercial street that had again a void at its center, a three level space, um, kind of dedicated to consumerism, and is actually a, a super interesting and unusual building. If you haven't been over there, I highly recommend that you go look at it. So each of the, of the pamphlets is a um, is a look at a kind of modern day uh, arcade, if you will, um, starting in the 1960s with uh, Cathedral Square, a much maligned project. Um, and the early projects are all um, kind of with this top down uh, planning uh, or renewal mentality. Um, but then they uh, transition over the years into a kind of more uh, bottom-up approach or even hybrid approaches uh, such as the Southlight project where um, where you have a, a number of different groups institutions governments etc kind of coming uh, and local communities coming together to figure out what to do on some of these sites um, so I'm just scrolling through these at this point um, and so Yep. So that's that is the project. We're actually it's on uh, exhibit in Seoul until November tenth. I imagine most of you will not be in Seoul <laughs> before November tenth. Um, but we are actually compiling a small scale book um, that we should have available in the next couple of weeks when uh, the printer gets paper back in stock, um, and that we'd love to share with people who are interested. Thank you. So I'm Alicia Odawale. If anyone has trouble pronouncing my name, it's fine. Most of my students just call me Dr. O. But uh, I'm excited about this project that I'm co-creating with Dr. Parker Van Valkenburg, who's assistant professor here at Brown University. i uh, sitting in the front row for those who don't know him. Uh, the two of us are co-creating this. And a lot of people, when I first present this work, ask how you two even got together. What's the connection? And the two of us, even though, of course, we look different, we're both in the same city. We were born and raised in Tulsa. And so we actually went to the same high school at different times. But we're, we're in these spaces together. We know this city. And this is the first time that even though we're two archaeologists that are working in two different corners of the world, I primarily work in the Caribbean. He's working in uh, Peru and teach at different institutions. We come together in the sense that this is our hometown. So this is the first time we've actually had the capacity to come and do something for our city with our, uh, with our expertise and our training. So we're really excited about that. So the first thing we had to do was try and get a project scope around. So in traditional archaeological research, you start with this research question. You pick a site and you're exploring that site with this specific research question in mind. But we did this the opposite way. We had a community, a community with needs, a community with questions, a community that for 100 years is still trying to wrestle with this event. Uh, so we wanted to first give honor to that community and take a slow approach to listen and then develop a project around that instead of having a research question first. So our first goal here was really to have the project to be community driven. 
and to be oriented towards restorative justice. And so in social justice platforms, you usually have restorative justice and retributive justice. So we're not seeking to try and you know, punish anyone or bring about any punitive aspects, but really develop a project that gives something back. I love what our presenters were talking about before, that you need to be able to offer something. And so with our research, the first goal was to centralize the community and be able to literally restore. What can we give back to the community that would change things as archeologists? So we developed this project, a Mapping Historical Trauma in Tulsa, is a multi-year project that brings together digital mapping, some new archeological research, and an exhibit. So we're putting together these different aspects that are usually separate in traditional archeological studies, but <clears throat> coming together specifically to uh, benefit the community. And so our first goal, uh, sorry, the way we are doing this work is through five goals that I'm gonna present. So the first one is creating critical sites of memory. And so critical sites of memory are specifically, whenever we're talking about the story of Black Wall Street, the story of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921, the story changes depending on who's telling it. But if you're able to anchor the story in specific places, specific times, specific dates, uh, then you're able to create these critical sites of memory that are fixed positions that anchor the story no matter who's telling it. So that's where this mapping piece is coming in. And then two, we wanted to identify uh, the current collections before we start our new excavation. So this is helping us pull together and collect, centralize the scattered information that's out there about the Tulsa Race Massacre. And I'll show you how scattered it is in a few slides. Uh, but that was even just as we're getting into this, we're discovering how scattered the resources are for this community. So one of the main goals was to identify what current collections are out there that are housing things related to the Tulsa Race Massacre. And then what can we then add to that when we do our new excavations, when we do our new research? And then three was to actually visualize the impact of the massacre through time. So as I mentioned, the, one of the main goals for this was to not only have you know, a map at the end of this, but to have something that will be a living, breathing document that we can show change in the footprint of Greenwood through time from before, during, and after the massacre, and that lasting impact to the communities, to the families, not just be, you know, dots on a map. Uh, use archeology span and radio cartography to, uh, sorry, radical cartography to create meaningful communities of practice. So what that means is we are trying to uh, give the community the tools they would need to research their own story to tell their own narrative. So we're not trying to place meaning on what's, uh, what are gonna be the outcomes of this, but literally be able to present the archeology, span present the digital map to as tools for the peop other people to use, and then they create the meaning around that. And where there are uh, communities of practice, it becomes generational, so that that generational knowledge is passed down from uh, in the future. So we, we want to, be working towards the centennial year 2021, but to have digital and physical resources to carry us through past that centennial year, because this has to be an ongoing conversation. And the last, I would say overall goal of this work is to have this map that will show this footprint through time that's shifting from 1921 to 2021. And why I bolded the historic Greenwood district is because our project is distinct from the city of Tulsa's mass graves investigation. So there's been a lot of renewed interest around looking for the, 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 the people that we've lost. But for our research, it's more important for us, well, it's equally important to look for the loss of homes, businesses, and livelihood as it is to look for bodies. So we need both of those pieces to tell this story. <clears throat> And uh, also, as we're trying to map the footprint of Greenwood through time, we've separated out into four phases because to tell the full narrative of the Greenwood community, you have to start from the beginning. So the phase, phase one for us is the rise of Greenwood from 1900 to 1920. So our uh, collaborator here that's in the front row, Jessica Shelton, wave your hand. We are so happy to have her on board because she is involved in looking into this rise of Greenwood. Greenwood starts well before Oklahoma is even a state in 1907. 
So before we even have statehood, we have families coming into Greenwood and establishing homes and businesses. They're not all popping up at the same time. They're coming in and establish, establishing this community organically. So Jessica is helping us piece that narrative together, but also this is creating our baseline, that first shape file, that first map that we can then build on for subsequent phases. Then phase two is the destruction of Greenwood. So we gave 1921 its own phase, specifically because of all the things that are happening, because we wanna be able to, of course, take a bird's eye view of Greenwood, but also be able to zoom in and discuss what's happening around the city at the exact same time in 1921. So this map actually came from Special Collections in the University of Tulsa. So Special Collections, uh, they have this, one of the largest photographic collections from the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, in, in the world. So we're happy to have that resource at the University of Tulsa, but the issue now is that we need to make this more visible and more known. So for this map, uh, this is just, I'm giving you an, uh, an illustration of what our three-dimensional map will look like. Well, this is like the low, the low version of it, but bear with me. <laughs> uh, so, we know that there's this initial false accusation, misunderstanding, whatever you want to call it, in the Drexel building, way over here. But what has been, um, I'm sorry, I have to walk around. I can't sit next to this. <laughs> but no, no, you have to. I have to? Yes, I'll take it. Is this one on the table? Okay, I'm free. Okay, so whenever we're trying to create a digital map of what's happened in Greenwood through time, looking at specifically May 31st through June 1st of 1921, this is where the height of racial violence is happening in Tulsa. So if we wanna map that, there's a lot of things that are happening simultaneously that uh, previous scholars have shown as a timeline of events, but have not shown it on a map what's happening around the city at exactly the same time. So we know right here, Drexel Building is kicking this all off. Uh, this is in the morning of May 31st. So whenever we have that happening by, oh, sorry. The, um, after that initial encounter happens, then later on in the evening, we have the courthouse. And so the courthouse way down here, there is a group of, white men, women, and children who are gathering around the courthouse. Sources are saying anywhere from 300 to 500 people are gathering around the courthouse. At the exact same time, uh, there are reports coming in of people breaking into the armory to arm themselves. At the exact same time, you have people in Greenwood that are hearing what's happening in the courthouse and in the armory and preparing for the worst. There's gonna be a lynching tonight. How can we stop this? So as they are trying to mobilize, strategize their next move, we have now, this group has now broken up into factions. Uh, they're not really that organized, they're just groups. So they're trying to push the people who are coming from the north to defend Greenwood. They're pushing them back. And then as the skirmishes keep going on, First Street becomes the first battle line of what's gonna be a war on Greenwood. So if we only have a timeline, we will never be able to picture what's happening around the city. These live stories. <coughs> Sorry. So a two-dimensional map will never allow us to capture all of that. And so that, that was just what's happening downtown. If you go north of the Frisco Railway, the same railway that's still part of segregating Tulsa, <coughs> we also have, hold on, let me get a drink. So later on in the evening, while all of this is happening, in Greenwood proper, there are still people in the Dreamland Theater watching a movie. It's not until 10 o'clock at night that Mr. Cotton tells his manager to turn the house lights on and clear the house. So there are people still you know, living their lives. What's their story? And then at Katy Railway Station, there's a train that runs from Oklahoma City to Muskogee. The people that came through here were stuck at Katy Railway Station from 10.45 to 6 a.m. Stuck on a train, hearing bombs, hearing gunshots, and you are stranded. 
What's their story? So we're only able to tap into those lived experiences if we're able to visualize them in a different way. <clears throat> so we're really excited about the map to do that. Okay, I think I can stay here now. So I wanted to stop and just mention that we're not the first uh, group to try and visualize this in a map context. So Scott Ellsworth, the author of Death in a Promised Land, he actually created this, uh, he created 10 maps specifically for the Tulsa race massacre, uh, what they, they called it the Tulsa race riot at that time, uh, commission report. So this was in 2001. And so in 2001, Scott Ellsworth created these uh, 10 maps to show the changes in Greenwood specifically from uh, May 31st until June 1st. But as he was creating this, so from the seeds of catastrophe to the final fighting and martial law is established, we are trying to seek to uh, compile all of this into one map because when Scott Ellsworth did this, he partnered with a graphic designer. They didn't use GIS. They didn't um, use um, any georeferencing or other maps or any of the photographic and documentary evidence that we're going to put into our map. So this is giving us a good starting point. So we can take these maps and then go further into the archives and then be able to embed uh, our resources into a more interactive three-dimensional map that will show this change in time. So in phase three, yeah, that was just phase two. So in phase three, this is the survival and recovery period from 1922 to 1950. Because in 1922, you still have people living in uh, internment camps. You still have people living in temporary housing. There's still a lot of flight going on. So there are ongoing court cases, lawsuits, and other things that are pending in this a period of just survival and recovery. So we want to tell those stories of Greenwood because that's, that's part of the narrative. And so as people are trying to rebuild and put their lives back into some sense of normalcy, we want to be able to visualize that as well. And then this last phase that we call renewal and reimagining, 1951 to the present. So this is probably the most problematic phase because <clears throat> whenever we think of, when Tulsans today think of Greenwood, this is the map that they have in their heads. Greenwood is Pine, Lansing, and MOK, and then the Frisco Railway. But now, since 1967, when 244 was put in, this is giving us yet another uh, battle line between the north and south, but also this is the shrunken version of the original Greenwood neighborhood. So for us to be able to show what Greenwood was and what it is, we have to talk about how this, this is not what it was originally. This is the shrunken down, gentrified, urban renewal version of the Greenwood neighborhood. And so the people who live in this community know that, but we're trying to show that in a different way so it's clear to everyone else. <clears throat> oh no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to get to this 15 minutes. Okay, year one. Uh, we have, so this is a four year project. Year one, we have the biggest thing happening is the Greenwood Centennial Resource Collection. And so this is allowing us to pull together that scattered evidence into one centralized location that will be online and visible to everyone. And year two, the biggest thing that's happening is the, the uh, start to developing the Greenwood Historical Web GIS. And so that's that three-dimensional map I was talking about, but it will be online searchable yet again. And so every part of this, every year, is meant to give something back to the community. <clears throat> and then year three, uh, biggest thing that's happening, this is the centennial year. So this is 2021. Most of our activities for this project are packed into here because that's what the community wanted. So uh, we are having, there are community meetings that are happening at least once a year, every year, but we're also going to have the start to our Greenwood excavations in year three. Oh, I didn't mention in year two, there's going to be surveys. So the locations of where we actually place our, exca our uh, excavations are going to be 
dependent on what the geophysical surveys tell us in year two. <clears throat> so the uh, other thing that we really value about this work is that before we do any of the disturbance of the earth in Greenwood District, we're going to have this pre-excavation opening ceremony that will pull together our community, our descendants, uh, descendants of survivors and victims, uh, pulling together people who have moved away. So it's really about honoring the people who built Greenwood before we dig into Greenwood. And then our last year, year four, is about pulling together whatever we've learned from this. Even if we find nothing in the course of these excavations, is to pull together all of our digital resources, the scattered information that we've pulled together, and put, put it in a new exhibit that's gonna be placed in the newly uh, renovated Greenwood Cultural Center, but they're turning it into the Greenwood District Museum, and so I'm, I'm not sure if you heard about that $9 million renovation in Tulsa, and so our work is gonna be placed into that museum, so we're really excited about that. So, in conclusion, we have a lot to do, but we just got our funding in May, so we are hitting the ground running. So since, since uh, June, we have started the work of pulling together those scattered resources, and we've already identified 26 institutions that, have, that house collections related to Tulsa Race Massacre history. Why? most of those are actually outside of Tulsa. So that gives questions about access to resources, access to telling your own history. If you don't even, if you say are looking for manuscripts and you find out that they're way on Yale University, you don't have any contacts in Yale, you don't even know how to go about that, that's a barrier to access. So we wanna centralize this and kind of break down some of these barriers, but first we gotta know what's out there. So we're still pulling this together but I wanted to thank our research collaborators. Uh, there's a number of individuals who have partnered with us to add additional research support or add additional expertise, say in development or, of our website and access to collections, access to geophysical equipment and training and in our um, lending their expertise to museum exhibit development. But we also have a lot of institutional partners, the top of which most of our funding is coming from the 1921 to 2021 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, and then our two institutions, Brown University and the University of Tulsa. But we have a number of groups that are working with us that, are, that have been doing this work for a long time. So we are really excited to just come alongside and support those ongoing works. And thank you very much. Okay, questions. Yeah, Jeff. Yes. Mike, uh, thank you all for those those um, great presentations. My question was for Dr. O and the uh, regarding the Tulsa project, which is um, just incredible and inspiring. Uh, you start off by talking about the um, the community driven restorative justice process, uh, kind of dimension to the project, and that this informed the aims of the project and other things. Could you say more about uh, how you all went about that? And, and for example, how community was defined uh, for that work and um, some of the priorities that came out of the community process and whether there were things that you ended up also prioritizing for other reasons. So I'll say that our priorities are still being formed. We're gonna have our first really public community meeting October 5th 
love for you all to be there, but it'll be in Tulsa. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we we are still gathering responses. We're still gathering feedback. But our initial thoughts and how we've constructed this, even though it's still forming, came from the Centennial Commission. The Centennial Commission is made up of community leaders. So it's like the community decided that they wanted to do a lot of works for the Centennial, and then they decided they wanted to have uh, something be a new research focus and then tapped us to do that work. So we didn't pick this. We were selected kind of in a way. So we had an idea and then presented that idea to the commission and then the commission decided if they wanted to fund it or not. So it was really more of a collaborative space that, that they decided you know, what they were going to fund or support and what they weren't. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it was really, completely different than how archaeological research usually works. <laughs> so the community really decided what, what they were going to do and what they weren't going to do. <laughs> so I wanted to ask my Providence friends um, if, if we could conceive of a project um, that was a broad street map uh, in the way of which th that would bring together all the work that everybody's done around Broad Street um, and think of a way, and I wondered if it would be useful um, to the Broad Street communities uh, to have such a map that came from them instead of came from Providence and was put on top of them. And everybody's got like a piece of that. And I wondered if it would be useful to bring it together. Mm -hmm. So my, my project, uh, the way it worked, it, it, they didn't want maps. Yeah, it was all about place-based, and this is where I live. So for me, it would make it, it would really yeah. be helpful. Right. Um, we did create the map only because it, you know, it is part of the walking tours. Yeah, and the maps that we created were created by the participants. So um, it's funny that you bring that up because one of the questions that's always coming about was promoting Broad Street, promoting yeah. Trinity Square. And some of the feedback I got from residents was what about the other parts of our neighborhood that are not getting showcased? Yeah. So when you think of South Side, you know, we have Broad Street, but then we have other corridors that have just as much information, just as much richness. And I would say, we would be interested in that project that could start off with there, but how could that then go to other parts of um, the of the neighborhood? Fair enough. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I can maybe add to that that uh, for me the, the map is a the map is a, is a great tool, but it, uh, the, I think the question for me is always what is it. What, what is it going towards? Yeah. And so I, I'd be kind of interested if, if uh, not to start with the idea of a map, like I'm not, I'm not sure what that necessarily achieves, but to think about where, uh, it, how might mapping be useful in other aspects of um, community revitalization or development or, or uh, other objectives that, that the that, uh, map might kind of help you through. Um, so usually I'm a critique. I, I'm a, like I critique when things are replicated over and over again. <laughs> so I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be great to collaborate. Uh, but I think there's also something to be said about the uniqueness of each project. And I think what I heard and what I experienced is that a lot of the journey itself was what made the project so interesting and not the product. Um, and so I think if you were to collaborate on something like this, you might. I mean, it would be just a different experience. Yeah. Um, so. uh, this is a question, maybe most of the way, but anyone who could respond to this, ha has there been any recognition at a city level of um, the problem of the way the city has been kind of broken up into these sort of artificial, and you know, and that it's the the feedback that's coming from communities, that it's not what communities want, it's dividing. I just want to be recognition or even move to change that? Um, no, not officially, but informally in these discussions they have been. Um, so for example, when our uh, neighbor association 
uh, not only was forming, but when we started tackling a lot of particular projects, in particular, the most notable was the St. Joseph's uh, concept or idea that came in 2017 when um, Paleo Properties had bought the property. They wanted to consolidate all social services and homeless shelters into that one building. And that kind of raised the ur of concentration of poverty, social services, and everything in that one area. Um, with that really started that conversation of South Side altogether. And that really did bring all of the five uh, neighborhood groups in South Side together to say, okay, we have a collective problem of concentration of everything. So Washington Park, they had an influx of nightclubs um, that was causing issues. We had an influx of social services. So we have informally started that collective conversation of us as South Side. How was that impacting? Um, and there was this drive for doing like a greater South Side uh, collective of all the neighborhood groups. And, and at that time, um, we declined because we wanted to focus on getting our neighbors mobilized in our section. How can we care for the whole entire city if we can't care for the ones that we initially said we wanted to focus on and, and do? But there is this, um, I would say, which has started as a two year conversation that has built on. Um, that particular focus that you are. No, no official recognition. I, I think when we brought that to the attention, the response was, okay, well, what can we do to focus on again on Broad Street and promoting that as opposed to looking at the neighborhood as a whole? Um, so it's, it's still sort of like back and forth in that, but I think just with time with us being consistent, we'll get there. <laughs> So their response to, to kind of follow up is that they they had uh, uh, some funds that were put aside to create uh, maybe maybe in an effort to bring the upper and lower together. They talked about calling Broad Street the Latino Cultural Corridor, um, and they were they had they were pushing that as a as a new name for this this one street that connects. Um, there was a lot of pushback, as you can imagine, from the the, the residents. Um, if I, I am working on an area that might be just a small area where the Latino history is, that maybe that could be the Latino Cultural Corridor. But instead of, you know, they were adding in another layer and another name to, to what's already uh, um, you know, two divided communities. I, I would say also, I think, um, you know, the conversations that Dwayne is starting to me are, are really important conversations about this, this kind of official map of Providence. Um, what is interesting is that I think if, if, if you go and ask the planners at city planning about the history of the official map of Providence, they don't know the history of the official map of Providence. They actually don't even have some of the official maps of Providence. Even going back is, or, you know, just 1940s, what was the official map of Providence before the highways went in? Um, so they, they don't have those records. No one's really done that work. Um, and I think it's really important. It's, it seems to be from conversations with them, there's sort of an impact of the census maps. So um, when the census is taken, there was sort of an overlay, and that seems to have impacted the official map of Providence. But there's also within city planning, you know, city planners want, as they say, chunks. They want city in chunks that they can deal with. Um, and so that creates a sense that, uh, you know, neighborhoods must be a certain size in order to be dealt with by the planners. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of what Dwayne is saying is really important, and I think um, there really needs to be an understanding of what that hit the history of that map for Providence, at least. Do you have a last question? I was just wondering, like, do you guys have a target audience, or is it, are the sites for everyone? And um, do DH projects make their way into high school history classes? I'm not familiar with like high school curriculums these days, and they weren't around when I was in high school. But I feel like they would promote empathy, and I hope they're widely accessible. So uh, that's how I began my work with the you know with the history of Latinos. Um, and I grew up in Texas, and I don't remember reading uh, anything about Mexican history. Uh, it was all from a, the white man cowboy point of view. Um, and it's the same way here. It's, it's all about white people, and maybe it's, it's a paragraph about Cesar Chavez or Martin Luther King in terms of people of color. 
And so my goal is to, to bring this history, and that was why I started offering walking tours and, and just giving the information to the to the young people more than I mean, the community who was interviewed, but also the young people. Um, so in terms of like a target audience, uh, I think again the journey was much more important for us than the product. Um, so then we were just excited to show anyone, <laughs> anyone who would look. <laughs> um, but we did go into schools. So as part of um, our program, we went into three Providence public schools, um, and we were teaching our core curriculum and seeing how it would look in the classroom during school time. Uh, and when we got to the portion with the mapping, it got really difficult because. We couldn't take kids out of school. <laughs> and so we had to get really creative about how do you map your school and your experience in the hallways and the bathrooms and what happens in the bathroom. <laughs> um, and so that kind of became interesting. But um, we weren't able to do it fully because of the limitations around field trips. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, our project was um, obviously uh, focused on an architectural audience <laughs> to a certain extent. And there's a uh, but I think in certain ways we had a, a dual audience. So there is the architectural and disciplinary architectural audience. There are all these amazing, amazing modern buildings in Providence that are completely neglected, um, both by the architects who design them, they don't show up in the monographs, but also by the city, which has a great, um, a great uh, kind of culture of preservation around 19th century and pre 19th century, pre 20th century. Um, Buildings, but basically tears down 20th century buildings left and right, regardless of their value. Um, and so, uh, trying to speak to the, the kind of architectural value of these, of these projects, um, but also to the kind of urbanistic values, so speaking to an urbanist audience and hopefully to a, a broader public audience, not even to buzzwords, so that people who are interested in modern architecture in, um, in the smaller cities, such as Providence, including Providence residents. Um, could could just get their hands on this. And take it away. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you asked that question back there because I was thinking the same thing. To what extent do we go beyond these kinds of conferences made up of you know experts who talk about this and listen to you talk about Tulsa? And most people in the country to this day don't know about that. Right. Okay, and I hear you talking, you speak with such passion, you must come from here, and I respect that. And so, to what extent is even Oklahoma including this in their curriculum? Because I remember back in elementary school working with math and then making more math even at the middle school. I was in middle school. Okay, and so how do we now bring that history alive, make certain everybody understands it? along with incorporating uh, mapping and the notion of talking about social justice and change through mapping, how is that working its way in the curriculum in Oklahoma? Or we're here in Rhode Island talking about this. So to what extent is this going beyond these kinds of spaces? And so I'm so glad you brought Thank that you. up because I was thinking yeah. the same thing. I was thinking was about working. your project too. Okay. You guys like I would love that in high yeah. school. So we partnered together to kind of have a two-fold mission to bring this out to from just our work. So I know Parker's kind of taking a lead on bringing this into high school settings. I'm taking a lead on implementing coursework at the collegiate level. So I'm developing a course that will launch, I put it on my slide, but I didn't mention it, uh, in spring of 2021. It'll be the first time TU has a course that specifically investigates the history and archaeology of Black Wall Street and Black family heritage in Oklahoma specifically. So that includes all Black towns, that includes uh, our Buffalo soldiers, that includes our forts, that includes a whole bunch of stories that aren't being talked about. But there's history, there's archaeology around all these spaces. So we're going to have new coursework, new, uh, new curriculum development, New, um, new work in our high schools, but bringing our students out to be part of it is really what where the goal is. So when I mention those excavations, we want to have students out there with us. When I mention our community meetings, students will be right there. So every part of this story, people will be able to, people and students will be able to plug in at different levels. So if you don't have six weeks to do an excavation, you can come to a meeting. 
you don't have a whole semester to the class, you can come to a presentation. So it's there's different ways to bring this out to the community. Uh, did you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Go back. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up because last week we had our regular meeting and one of the you know, <coughs> focuses was on the housing crisis in Rhode Island. And one of the things that we did is that we identified obviously one of the residents who lives in that neighborhood. His house is actually in the area where the parking lot for the hospital is surrounding it. So he's one of those long-term residents who was there when those parking lots were homes and actually was able to provide his narrative about the evolution of the neighborhood and the impacts on it. So I would say from a neighborhood perspective, we're like, we need to get those long-term residents those who have those stories, those who can tell that, and how do we get them to these places, these outlets where they can share their story. So that was one of the things that we had started off with and that we're just continuing on in our series talking about um, the housing in our neighborhood, was that how do we get those resident stories, that evolution of information, but they get that to these types of settings where they can be shared. So it's like inviting groups like this to the neighbors come to us, we need to go to them, and and extracted information, not so much just having having these gatherings, but going out to them where they are at and creating that inclusive uh, environment for them to feel comfortable with sharing that information. Uh, my job is to, uh, to put a pin in it, uh, as, as to use maybe a mapping. Uh, and one of the things that um, has, has moved me most about the many projects we've heard today is that I can't think of one that doesn't have an educational component, that isn't in the schools, that isn't about uh, talking and taking them into the ideas that we're talking about uh, directly to uh, young people. Um, and since that's my life's work, uh, I find this a very mo a moving part about every um, project that we've heard about uh, today. Um, and so um, I, I was going to call on Shannon to see if she had any uh, final words, having started us off so well. But if not, we'll hear them over a glass of wine. We are inviting everybody uh, down to the um, Nightingale Brown House to the Center for Public Humanities at 357 Benefit Street. You enter on 50 William Street. Or if you want to walk across campus with us, we'll go down through the garden off Power Street. Um, glad to see you. We have glasses of wine and um, seltzer and beer and some cheese and crackers for anybody who still has some energy and, and wants to talk about all these uh, amazing ideas. I, I You know, and um, a conference is as good as its planning, when this one was fabulous, as good as its speakers and as good as its audience. And so I wanna thank all three uh, of those groups for really a remarkable day. Thank you.